supercars. What is a supercar? What does the prefix super actually depict? There's always been an emotional head bumping between car nerds where that invisible line is that divides a garden variety sports car from a supercar. Some might throw in the argument that a supercar is a mid-engine which is quite frankly too narrow as it would exclude great cars like a lot of front-engine Ferraris. What about sheer horsepower? Now that should be a metric that makes the definition easier. One thing is sure, the supercar resides in a top echelon of the motor vehicle food chain. They're the great whites that roam the roads and have unassuming Fiat Pandas for breakfast. I think what most of them have in common is that they're usually only obtainable by the famous one percenters and the rest of us mere models can only own and drive them in our dreams. The next argument I would like to add is rarity. You don't see them too often while shopping for your groceries, unless you're living in London that is, where the actual encounter with one of them is very likely. Furthermore is the asking price of one of those machines, which usually is mind-bogglingly high. Nowadays seven digits are the norm for one of those great sounding road ripping examples of car pornography. It comes to show that you need a super income to have a super car. In this video I want to show you what the 90s had to offer in supercar terms. So Let's dive right into it. Number 1. The Pagani Zonda C12 The story of the Zonda starts like a movie scene, somewhere in the small town of Balcate in Argentina. A young energetic man visiting his idol and telling him that he wants to design a car and dedicate it to him. To which the idol replies, you may do so, but only if the car's heart is carrying a star because I am a Mercedes man. The young man's name is Horacio Pagani, the son of a painter and baker, and the idol is none other than the legendary Juan Manuel Fangio. The car was indeed created, the Pagani Zonda C12 Coupe, an unmistakable super sports car in the style of old Sauber Mercedes Group C racing cars. And between the occupants and the rear axle, as desired, works an engine with a star, the mighty Mercedes 6 liter V12 with 394 horsepowers. To be fair, the Zonda debuted in 1999 and only 5 were built between 99 and 2002, so technically it's not exactly a 90s supercar, but this masterpiece and driving proof of fine Italian craftsmanship had to be in this list. You can spend a lifetime searching for a part in a Zona that hasn't been graced by Horatio's sense of design and you would die without finding one. Even some very unpretentious parts like bolts carry the logo of their company paying witness to the attention to detail that went into the manufacturing of the car. You want to know what dedication to your job means? Look at the Zonda. The first of its breed the C12 could accelerate to 60 miles per hour in 4.2 seconds and would end pursuing even more speed at 185 miles per hour. Located in the dreamy village of San Cesario sul Panaro, Pagani Automobili has been hand building these pieces of art in very low numbers. That exclusivity carries a hefty price tag today. To indulge in this MoMA worthy sports car you would have to part with at least 1.5 million dollars. <laughs> Number 2. The Porsche 911 GT1 The second car on our list came to life out of necessity. Like many other supercars that were built in low numbers, it was homologation rules that mandated that at least a small number of them were available to the general public. Porsche wanted to race in the GT1 class at Le Mans and the rules dictated 25 production cars. As that number wasn't chiseled in stone, Porsche got away building just 23. So after closely examining the FIA rulebook, a cunning plan was hatched and the engineers of Porsche's racing department were let loose. Norbert Singer was in charge of the project and the orders that were handed down to him stated, build it fast and keep the 911 spirit. Mr. Singer being a German pragmatic engineer took the front of the then in production 993 and added the rear of a 962. The two underlike halves were kept together by space age round tube scaffolding. To trick the eye into believing that this was actually one car, a gorgeous carbon fiber body was draped over the Frankenstein construction approach. The GT1 was powered by a 3.2 liter flat 6 accompanied by two KKK turbochargers. Since the car was to be road legal and somewhat drivable in ordinary asphalt, the engine was detuned to 536 horsepower. That still didn't stop the GT1 from reaching 60 miles per hour in 3.6 seconds. The end of the engine's capacity for acceleration was reached at 194 miles per hour. To give the GT1 at least some ingredients of a street legal road car, the ground clearance was increased, the suspension lost some teeth and sumptuous leather seats were thrown into the mix. Voila! You fancy the brief but glorious moments of a Le Mans driver yet in a much more comfortable environment, then you would have to master the funds necessary, which currently stand at 8 to 9 million dollars. Number 3. The Mercedes CLK GTR it takes a lot of imagination or hallucinogens to connect the CLK Coupe as the base for the CLK GTR. In fact, the two cars share only the headlights, the rear lights and the door handles. The rest is hardcore and race-oriented engineering. 
Billed as an opponent for the Porsche GT1, the order for the development was given on December 5, 1996. Only 128 days later, the car was ready for testing in Harama. The development time was as fast as the car itself. The GTR was first entered the Fiat GT1 class in 97 and completely fulfilled the requirements of its creators. Mercedes outclassed the competition with two championship wins in 97 and 98. Interestingly, the road versions weren't built until after the end of the GT1 racing series. 20 coupes and 5 roadsters were offered for sale to deep pocketed customers. These had to bring along a high measure of physical fitness since performing the feat of entering the car demanded a lot of creative use of hands and legs. Once they managed to jungle climb behind the steering wheel, they were welcomed by airbags, leather seats, ABS and a totally useless CD radio. Useless because after you turned the keys to wake up the 6.9 V12 powerhouse, the noise inside the cockpit was dominated by the sounds generated by the mechanical sitting right behind you. 612 horsepowers are at the disposal of the fortunate owner which gave him the opportunity to crack the 0-60 to dash in 3.4 seconds. Top speed was reached at 191 miles per hour. The Brave could have had the engine bored out to 7.3 liters buying them an extra 52 horsepowers. The GTR wasn't made for long range cruising, the seating position was awkward, the suspension's only job was to keep the car's floor away from the road and the noise was infernal. Also it was a good idea to have your chiropractor join the drive because god knows you needed him. But if you still insist being temporarily deaf, then you could have a GTR for currently around 4 to 5 million dollars. <laughs> Number 4. The Jaguar XJ220 The Jaguar XJ220 is by some accounts a car that failed to deliver its high hung promises. But did it really? Jim Randall, a Jaguar engineer, was firmly believing that his company could build a car that would successfully rival the Ferrari F40 and the Porsche 959. He gathers a group of fellow engineers who would then proceed to design the car in their spare time. The Saturday Club was created. On paper, the metrics were promising. A V12 was a propulsion unit of choice and an all-wheel drive system should transfer the power onto the road. Top speed was set at 220 miles per hour, hence the name. The management caught wind of the idea and gave it a green light, and then 1,500 customers lined up to buy one of the 350 project cars and transfer the buy-in payment of 50,000 pounds. But then tragedy struck, when Ford took Jaguar over and the pencil-wielding penny crunches from Ford decided that the XJ220 is too expensive and hence uneconomical. The door is now open ordinarily sideways, the V12 gets axed in favor of a V6 and the four-wheel drive system is tossed out the window altogether. But the supercar world is dominated by metrics and superlatives, and a V6 just wasn't cutting it. Only very very few actually noted that the 3.5 liter produced 550 horsepower, 23 more than the V12. The car being lighter because of the smaller engine and missing four wheel drive system achieved a 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds. The top speed stood at 212 miles per hour, making it faster than the F40. Regardless, the XJ220 was sucked in the burst of the supercar speculation bubble and a disqualification at Le Mans sealed the fate of the Jaguar supercar. Testers relentlessly moaned about the small boot in a supercar, really? The damage was done and only 271 cars were built that also had the stigma of being a maintenance nightmare. Owners of the car love it though. It is faster than the F40, the engine's performance is sublime and the brakes are more than able to stop the XJ220's forward thrust. If you have the forearms of Arnold Schwarzenegger necessary to operate the XJ220, you can have your own for around 600,000 US dollars. Number 5. The Lamborghini Diablo GT the act of designing a new car is hard, but can be elevated to damn hard if the car you are trying to replace is the world's most renowned poster boy, the Countach. However, Marcello Gandini executes a design test with flying colors and the Lamborghini Diablo rolled into the light. The car is simply beautiful, stunning, nothing is too much, every detail of the car makes your eye want to pause and linger. As with every supercar, the metrics by which it is measured are set by the competition, so each and every iteration had to be faster and more powerful than the rest. The Diablo GT was created in 1999 with the mission to outrun every other supercar in the market, though it must be noted that the McLaren F1 and the Bugatti EB110 weren't produced at the time when the GT was presented to the world. The modus operandi to achieve speed dominance included the 6 liter V12 producing 575 horsepowers. In order to make the engine's job easier, weight was shed by removing the following drive system. This enabled the Diablo GT to propel its inhabitants to 60 in 3.9 seconds. But more importantly, the now new owner of Lamborghini, Audi, had its engineers to sprinkle their fairy dust over the car to remedy some of the problems that have been plaguing Diablo for years, namely the handling and interior department. Firstly, the Audi engineers added 100mm of front track width, making the front wheels poke out 50mm further on each side. 
that changed the road holding skills and the driving position profoundly. Also some gadgets like rear view cameras which were useless at nights and better seats were added. The use of carbon fiber was extended inside and out. Although the GT never cracked the numbers on the Nürburgring set by the Porsche 911 Turbo, it had its eureka moment in Hockenheim where it managed to show the racer from Zuffenhausen its rear. The price of the then 575,000 Deutschmarks. 250,000 more than a Diablo SV was based on math that could be handled by a 10 year old. 1,000 Deutschmarks per horsepower. 83 GTs were built and are at the time of this writing being sold for 900,000 US dollars. <laughs> Number 6. Ferrari F50 In the beginning of the 90s, the recession hit hard, and most car junkies out there had to reevaluate their spending habits. The F40 left great footsteps and was the last car commissioned by Il Comendatore himself, Enzo Ferrari. The new supercar to conform to change legislation regarding safety and a new owner's dictums, Fiat. So the F50 was designed from the get-go as a more humble, more usable supercar than its predecessor. Don't get me wrong though, the F50 wasn't a slouch. Its engine is based on a 3.5 liter V12 from Ferrari's 1992 Formula 1 car. Ferrari's engine department opened the engine up to 4.7 liters which resulted in 520 horsepower. The body is the branch of Lorenzo Ramacchiotti and a beautiful job he did. The awe-inspiring V12 is visible through the rear mesh and plexiglass engine lid, adding to a great sense of drama. And the rounded feminine shape of the F50 gave it a refinement that the F40 could not hope to achieve. The fit and finish is something to appreciate, and a digital dash must have brought out the inner teenager in every owner. While the F50 couldn't match the F40 on speed and handling alone, it made up for its shortcomings with style and panache. The F50 was a different sort of product. Though the interior is simplistic, it feels like expensive, comforting, elegant when contrasted with its predecessor's Spartan interpretation of a cockpit. Another party trick the removable top made the F50 Monte Carlo friendly. The driving sensation was also unflawed. The exercise of 0 to 60 was accomplished in 3.7 seconds. 100 miles per hour were passed 4.3 seconds later. Top speed set at 202 miles per hour. Its problem wasn't that it was too slow, but it was the benchmark that it was compared to the McLaren F1 and the Ferrari F40. We are so far ahead of everything else. The F50 reflected the change of times. From 1995 to 1997, only 349 F50s were built. It's this exclusivity that demands a higher premium compared to the F40. Prices are currently in the $4 million range. Number 7. The Vector W8 if the Countach and the F117 Nighthawk stealth bomber were to have a baby, it would very much look like the Vector W8. The W8 was poised to set the supercar world ablaze, but sadly didn't. It was Jerry Wiegert's obsession with aeronautical engineering that he deemed had a place on the road. His first drawings date back to 1971, which eventually materialized in the Vector W2 prototype. Further refinements took another 19 years until in 1990 the finished embodiment of Wiegert's dream, the Vector W8, was ready for production. Well, but it wasn't really ready, more on that later. The car was powered by a 6-liter all-aluminium V8 that was flanked by two Garrett H3 turbochargers. This trio produced an alleged 633 horsepower and a face-ripping 630 foot-pounds of torque. Wiegert lived the mantra that compromises for the weak. He looked at total supremacy and that came with a price. The aforementioned fancy for aircraft construction principles had him use aircraft-grade rivets and materials. Almost everything was aircraft-grade, including the wiring. The pilot sensation didn't stop at the outside. Once placed in the comfy leather seats, he looked at a dashboard that could have come straight off of F-14 Tomcat, including a monitor. Yes, he did that in the 90s. The price tag was a healthy 450,000 US dollars. The hook though was that the car wasn't tested. As soon as a magazine got their fingers on one, they would usually quit cooperating and broke down. So much so that Wiegert would always show up with two cars to have one backup, at one time being deeply humiliated when both cars broke down. This and a complaint of a famous tennis player whose W8 actually burned the interior carpet due to the exhaust getting too hot. Customer interest was almost absent. Add the bad press into the mix and paying customers were running for the hills. Although Road and Track magazine praised the car in almost every aspect and signed on a 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds, the damage to Vector's reputation was already done and the company went into receivership in 1993 after 17 Vectors were built in a pair of prototypes. Whether it's the unreal design of the W8, the rarity or the amount of outlandishness, the prices have climbed and you would have to part with 750,000 of your hard earned dollars. Number 8. 
Number 8. The Bugatti EB110 Romano Artioli loves Bugatti himself being a renowned collector and longtime admirer of the mark. Mr. Artioli was on the hunt for a supercar but wasn't able to find anything that would meet his standards. Standards that his great idol Ettore Bugatti has set. Only the best is good enough. So he set out on the endeavor to create his very own specimen of a supercar and while he was at it he might as well bring back the iconic brand from Moldsheim. Details for driving the now new owner of the Bugatti brand. The factory was opened on the 15th September 1990, Ettore Bugatti's 109th birthday, not in Molsheim, but in Campo Galliano near Modena. Reason for choosing this location is the company is in the neighborhood, cramped the manufacturers like Lamborghini, Ferrari, De Tommaso and Maserati, so finding fellow Bugattisti was easy. Just to show how much of an admirer Artioli was, the canteen had the original entrance door from the Molsheim factory fitted. Only the best ingredients were accepted. The wheels were cast from magnesium. The body was a sensible composition of carbon and aramid fiber and aluminium. The engine is a 3.5 liter V12 with 4 camshafts that operated a total of 60 valves. To pressure the inside of the cylinders even further, 4 turbochargers were installed to minimize the dreaded turbo lag. A 4 wheel drive system was tasked with providing the necessary traction aided by 2 differentials. Besides the gas pedal, the only other possible driver interaction was through a 6 speed manual gearbox. This car was a massive statement and one that Ettore would have been proud of. The Bugatti stormed onto the market in 1991 and right from the get-go had two world records on its belt. Fastest accelerating car and fastest production car. The record numbers were simply jaw-dropping as the Bugatti rushed from a complete standstill to 60 in just 3.26 seconds, fast enough to declass supercars of today. Top speed was clocked at 212 miles per hour, heck even Michael Schumacher bought one. But it was the 90s, remember? Wall Street brought supercar shopping to a screeching halt. Artioli got invested into Lotus which ended in a disaster. After 96 EB110 GTs and 32 Supersports, the curtain falls for the company in 1995. Wanna chime in? Then factor in just a trickle south of a million for the GT and almost three for the Supersport. Number 9. Chizetta V16T The supercar world of the 90s sometimes gave birth to some very weird family members. An ex-Lamborghini engineer, an accomplished car designer and a music producer, that was the unlikely trio that set out to shake the foundations of the then established supercar machines available. The 16-cylinder behemoth was a dream of Claudia Zampoli, a former Lamborghini engineer who was running the Lamborghini and Ferrari franchises in Los Angeles. He had the technical knowledge to proceed with the project, but he was lacking funds and design. The monetary part was solved by onboarding Grammy-winning music composer Giorgio Moroda. That subsequently changed the name of the car to Chisetta Moroda V16T. Chisetta, by the way, is made up of Claudia Zampoli's initials C and Z in Italian, C and Z. Tasked with the artistic part was none other than the design mastermind Marcello Gandini, who gave us the Miura and the Countach. Coincidentally, Marcello designed the Countach as successor to Diablo, but Lamborghini's new owner Chrysler watered down the design to the extent that a furious Gandini left. It was these original Diablo designs that would find new use in the Chisetta supercar. The engine had to be great, exuberant, never done before, so 16 cylinders it had to be. Oliviero Pedrazzi accomplished this by uniting two Lamborghini V8s used in the Lamborghini Uraco P300. The engine was placed transversely, hence V16T in the car, which is the reason for it being so wide. The power plant produced 542 horsepower, which propelled the all aluminum built car to a top speed of 202 miles per hour. The obligatory run from 0 to 60 was done in 4.5 seconds. The car was complicated in every aspect and the production of the first car was delayed numerous times. When Moroda set out to find a new power plant in Bavaria to get the car fast on the road, Sampoli was, as the British say, very cross. Moroda left the company in 1990 taking car number 1 with him. The car's asking price was 649,000 US dollars. Project build numbers were 52 units, but the supercar crowd wasn't as interested as expected and only 8 cars plus 2 prototypes were built. The company closed the doors in 1995. Fun fact, you can still order a Chisetta to this day, so technically it never went out of production. The price for an original V16T? On January 21st, 2021, RM Auctions auctioned a Chisetta previously owned by the Sultan of Brunei for 665,000 US dollars. Number 10. The McLaren F1 The holy grail. The Mac daddy of them all. 
the El Presidente of the Supercar Club, those and many other superlatives were attached with the legendary F1. Even by today's standards, the McLaren F1 can easily keep up with the current rules of the supercar roost. Gordon Murray, at the time technical director for the McLaren racing team, sketched up a three-seater sports car as early as 1969. It took 20 years when a certain Ron Dennis, then boss of McLaren, okayed the project. His rationale being that McLaren was on its sporting prime, winning almost anything on the racetrack. Why not on the road? Dennis was known for his no-compromise approach. The new car had to be brand new, the best of the best. As many parts as possible should be produced in-house to be independent from suppliers, and the design should follow function and not current taste or fashion. The car was presented in 1992 and the price was absolutely insane. 970,785 US dollars. Nobody had ever publicly asked that kind of money for a motor vehicle. 300 cars were to be built as was guaranteed in the sales contracts. Peter Stevens designed the body and on behalf from Ron Dennis no visible protrusions like flashy spoilers were allowed. The air management necessary to keep the car pressed on the road at 200 miles per hour was done internally only. So a myriad of active area elements and a trick turbine in the rear gave the F1 the reaffirming contact with the asphalt. All the car's innards were subjected to Dennis's functional philosophy. The body was made from carbon fiber, the entertainment system was developed in-house to save a few grams, even the onboard toolkit was made of titanium to achieve weight saving. All-wheel drive? Too heavy. ABS? Not good enough. Turbos? No thank you. The engine was created by Paul Roche, BMW's engine wizard, by taking a box standard S70 engine from the BMW 850 CSI and throwing every engineering goodness at it. This resulted in a 6.1 liter V12 with 627 horsepower, enough to catapult the F1 from 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds. But it was a top speed that cemented the F1 in the history books. To this day, the F1 with its top speed of 242.91 miles per hour is the fastest naturally aspirated production car in the world. Murray was asked in a 1993 interview why he insisted on a manual 6 speed box from ZF and he said, a semi-automatic would have been easier to implement. But our customers wanted to be kept busy while driving their car. That's why the Volkswagen Beetle, the 911 and the Ferrari have survived to this day. 106 cars were built from 1992 to 1996. If you think the outlandish asking price was insane, check out current auction results. Gooding & Company sent one off to its new caretaker for a brain-bending $20,465,000 US dollars. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robin Yuga. More videos to follow. Thanks for watching. Bye.